Hi everyone, we're back with the first of the Mibby's Eye podcast series for 2024, EU or AFTA? It's an ongoing question, it comes up a lot in discussions between indie supporting people. Fiona and I went over to Edinburgh the other week to a Yes for EU meeting. It was a whole afternoon's workshop, actually. Very, very interesting. Great group of people there. It consisted of a lot of inputs, really, of information about things that we don't hear very much about, like the EU association agreement that all candidate countries get. If that was part of the conversation about EU and EFTA, it just brings a a whole nother dimension to it. There's two great speakers, Kirsty Hughes, who we've featured on our shows before, and Heather Anderson, former MEP. But the main point of the afternoon was that people were having table discussions. One of the participants said, oh, if only we could put this into an hour's show and then come out to the yes groups with it. So we thought, well, let's do that. We've put the inputs together. We've given you discussion topics as well if you want to take part in the discussion just pause have your chat and then resume yeah. and if you do that why not send your thoughts in to yes for eu we'll put their email address on in the notes yeah that is actually what we all did on saturday afternoon there we had we had some input we paused we had a discussion and but there was a further set of topics that were also discussed weren't there farm payments eu farm payments borders with england currency what the EU requires, what it doesn't require, and also electricity interconnectors and where the EU is going with its energy policy. So lots in this. Hope you enjoy it. We'll head on to the workshop now where Yes for EU convener Morag Williamson is about to welcome everybody to the event. So Yes for EU uh, campaigns for independence and EU membership for Scotland, the clue is in the name. We're not aligned to any uh, political party. Uh, We're affiliated to Believe in Scotland, Umbrella, uh, National Yes organisation, and we collaborate with local Yes groups and regional Yes groups as well, some of whom are here today represented. So thanks very much for coming. This is a new kind of event for us because it's going to be uh, a lot of focus on discussion. Basically, we know that the majority of Scots do want to be back in the EU, but actually there's not an awful lot of information out there uh, about how Scotland would join the EU once we are independent. And a lot of myths flying around that we hear regularly when we're out campaigning. So, the Scottish Government papers have been quite helpful in terms of information. Um, I have got one here, which you can get free if you write to a Scottish Government address. So they're quite helpful, but there's still quite a lot of kind of uh, grey areas. So really what we're aiming to do today is to uh, raise awareness. We've got expert speakers that we'll introduce in a moment, and then we want to know your views and what your concerns are. So our focus is uh, very much on divergence, how we're diverging from EU standards and EU regulations, which of course is happening already since Brexit. And, And so when we do join the EU, we will need to make sure that we are aligning uh, with EU uh, standards and laws and so on. So that's really what the focus is today and we'll be looking at some particular topics um, in relation to divergence and uh, the alignment that that will need to take place. Um, So Heather's going to speak and then Kirsty's going to speak and then after that we have our topics for discussion which we'll introduce and then we hope that you will uh, talk about it, discuss round the tables, uh, give us your uh, thoughts, answers, comments on that uh, flip chart paper. So we're very much interested in your participation today. There will be follow-up. We'll, we'll plan to do a report on this event and uh, put that together and then do some perhaps follow-up events or other campaign action based on what, what we're finding out today. So it's a case of sort of learning together today. We're not experts, by the way. Yes, we're you team. Uh, we're not the experts. <laughs> the first year, the experts. We're not experts, but we hope to facilitate discussion and, um, and, and come around and hear how you're getting on uh, when you're discussing this around the table. The first topic is the question of EU or EFTA. And the first speaker is Heather Anderson, former MEP. I know that we get used to thinking of ourselves as complete basket cases and that we're incapable of doing anything and we're told this every day 
And when you go to Europe, you're suddenly confronted with all these people who think Scotland is amazing, who think we're entirely competent, who think we're capable of doing astonishing things and working collaboratively, and have a very high regard for us. And you come back to Scotland and say, I really wish you could see yourselves as other people see you. I remember we had, you know, Hamza had gone to the New York Climate Week, and at that particular week, I can't remember what the scale of the attack on Scotland and our competence was, but he came back and he said, it's amazing, in New York, they think Scotland's astounding, they think we're a world leader, we think we've got really strong values. And you come back here, and we're incapable, you know, of running a corner shop, you know? <laughs> so it's, it's just that thing about the warmth in Europe was phenomenal, um, people were very, very, very clear that Scotland's position was different, so they hadn't understood it before, and then they got introduced to the Brexiteers, and they realised that was an English nationalism <laughs> project on steroids, so they completely differentiated Scotland from that point. Um, and I was certainly given lots of cards for when we come back. So I keep saying, you know, I had four days in Europe, but hopefully it was just the first four days, not the last four days. I've got some stats to cheer you up. Um, 62%, anybody know what that statistic is? Scottish vote. That was the Scottish vote to remain every single local authority. 68% what it is now. So support for being in the European Union in Scotland is now 68%. 70% 70 of people who voted from no in 2014 to yes did it because of Europe. Because they just thought, I don't want to be in this union, I'd rather be in that other union, 70%. So it's a massive swing issue. 67% of, I think it's 35 to 50 year olds support being in Europe. 57%, anybody got that one? 57% <laughs> is the number of people in the UK who think Brexit's a disaster. <laughs> Right? But they're not allowed to say that. You know, so that, these are the people who say this hasn't quite worked. Is it the sunny upland uplands have not appeared? Um, so all those statistics are very powerful. There was a, a research thing came out last week, what Scotland thinks. I don't know if some of you read that. And they presented 10 scenarios where they said, would we be better outside the UK and in Europe in these scenarios? In nine of the 10 scenarios, people said we'd be better in Europe than out of the UK. And it wasn't by small margins, so between 15 and 22% more people thought Scotland would receive more funding and higher levels of subsidy and support. They thought Scotland would have a stronger voice in world affairs, Scotland would have better environmental policies, Scotland would have higher wages, Scotland would have a lower cost of living, and Scotland would have a stronger economy if we were in the EU and not in the UK. And even, it was 27% um, said, on the next three that wouldn't make any difference, but even then more people thought our NHS would be better, our public would be less polarised, and we'd have more control over our internal affairs. So what's staggering about these statistics is that creaking, you know, that sort of calving of the glacial edge of the, the broad shoulders of the UK government and how we have to be there because they will look after us. And people are now saying, no, no, actually, we think we could do a better job. And I don't know if some of you have read Lester Rick's wonderful last book, that thing about it's confidence. Yeah. It's confidence. It's not about technical arguments. It's about having a belief that we can make the best decisions. And even when we get it wrong, we'll then correct it. It's belief that we can do it, that we're missing. The 10th scenario was immigration. 40% of people who were questioned thought we'd have more immigration in Scotland, but they thought that would be a good thing. So it wasn't presented as a UK thing, as a disaster, we had to you know, send people to Rwanda. And all that came about, we know we need people to come here. So out there, people are shifting their views. They've got nowhere to go politically um, in England with any of these views, and they've got a democratic deficit. And I was just recently at the IFA, um, and IFA was a group in Europe that we were members of, and they were having their annual summit where they drafted their manifesto. And in their manifesto was a commitment to Scotland having the right um, to choose its own future in a referendum. So they are arguing the European Union that countries like Scotland should have the right to democratic route. And they were saying, how are you feeling in Scotland? And it's that thing where you say it's quite difficult because if you're a Democrat 
and you believe in things like the rule of law, democracy, you know, transparency, <coughs> and you win democratic elections eight times, and you get a mandate to have a referendum, and you have a very clear view on something, it is pretty demoralising to have that constantly ignored. And people keep saying, well, why haven't you fixed it? And we're still dealing with the reality that we're in a non-democratic country, that we're not in a voluntary union, we're in an involuntary union, and whatever we say doesn't matter. And I don't know if some of you saw that the Labour Party manifesto didn't mention Scotland, so you know, we're all hoping for the best. Anyway, that's, that's some of the things um, that I wanted to say at the beginning. Thank God you keep meeting, thank God you keep pushing, we will get there. I had to say something about EFTA in the EU, and I really tried. Okay, <laughs> so the key thing about EFTA is it was formed back in 1960. It's got Iceland, Liechtenstein, Norway and Switzerland in it. And when it was formed in 1960, it was formed as a trade bloc. And five of the other partners who were formed with it have left and joined the EU. So five of the founding members, Denmark, Portugal, Austria, Finland and the UK, left EFTA because it was better being in the EU. So that's your starting point, that you know, the people who were in EFTA, apart from Iceland, Iceland and Norway, you could see it around fishing, that they might want to be out of there. Switzerland did not even join the EEA, so it's in a case of its own. The key thing about EFTA is that um, in, in 1994, they formed the European Economic Area to broaden the single market so that F, the EFTA could be in there. And as far as I can see, you pay a lot of money to access Erasmus and Horizon in the single market. Um, you absorb the regulations, you comply with, you, know, you put into your own legislation, European legislation, you agree with the four freedoms, you obey the rules, um, and you don't have a vote. And I think Scotland's kind of been there and done that. You know, <laughs> so we, we didn't have a seat at the table. Um, we, we paid the money, we agreed with everything, it affected our legislation, but we couldn't have any influence or control. So been there, done that, got the t-shirt, can we just go for the real deal and get back into the European Union and be a member state, a sovereign member state. We've just got to do that wee thing about getting independence first, because we can't join until we're a real state, but you all know that. So thanks for all the work you do. The next speaker is Dr. Kirsty Hughes, interviewed by yes for EU's Sam Page. I'm delighted to introduce Dr. Kirsty Hughes, who uh, is an expert on EU relations with, with Scotland. I'm going to ask some questions relating to an association agreement. So obviously my first question is, what is an association agreement? Okay, thank you. It's, it's lovely to be able to do this video and I'm sorry not to be with you in person. Um, an association agreement, you, you can sort of think of it as a, a trade agreement plus because it's, it's like a, a, a deep trade agreement, you could say. Ukraine has one uh, and it's called a deep and comprehensive free trade area. And, and then the Western Balkans, for instance, have each country of the candidates there have stabilization and association agreements. But also countries who aren't candidates to join the EU can have those agreements with Brussels um, because it, it creates a stronger framework, not only for trade, but also for social, cultural and political issues. From the EU's point of view, if you are a candidate country and so you're embarking on or in the middle of the accession process, it's a place where the steps in the accession process uh, can feed into relations between the two, the EU and the candidate country. Are they all the same? Um, obviously, they're different countries. Do they cover the same topics in each one, the same issues? They're very similar, but they're not identical. Um, so certainly it depends, as, as I said, on whether a country is a candidate country or not. It also depends on particular issues around, around the individual country. Um, it might be something as simple as does the does the country have a coast? Does it have a fishing industry or not? Or it, it might be other other more tricky technical issues about particular sectors of the economy. So on the one hand, 
The EU is very used to negotiating these deals. Uh, there is, to some extent, there's a, if it's not a template, it's kind of like an outline template. But equally, just as you wouldn't impose identical trade agreements on any straightforward free trade agreement with another country, nor would you do so with an association agreement. So they do have to be negotiated. And I guess one question for an independent Scotland doing that is how long it would take. Considering it, often a, an association agreement is a first step to, to becoming an accession country or to actually rejoining the EU, why are they hardly ever mentioned in the media or even by our politicians? I think it's quite curious in the Scottish case, given that the, the aim of the SNP and the aim of the Scottish government is independence in the EU, that they don't talk about association agreements more. I think it's maybe part of a, a bigger issue around the way independence is argued for, where people like to talk about the final state, you know, when we're independent and when we're doing as well as Denmark or when we're in the EU. But of course, it's obvious to everybody, the transition is really important. And whether that transition is the one you're focusing on in terms of how you get from independence to being a candidate with an association agreement to joining the EU, or whether it's the economic transition, or whether it's some other political legal transition, transition in a sense is at the heart of the, the independence debate, because it's fine to say we'll be this sort of independent country 10 or 20 years hence, but people want to know about their immediate future. So do all countries that are currently involved in the enlargement process uh, have an association agreement? Yes, they all um, do. And actually, uh, to be honest, I didn't know this, but I, I, I was Googling around this knowing I was talking to you. And I knew that in the 1990s, all the Central and East European candidates after the Berlin Wall came down, they all, they all had an association. Ah, agreement. okay. But yeah, Greece, yeah. that I did know, but Greece apparently had one of the earliest back in something like 1961, long before it became a candidate to join and it didn't join for another 25 years. So does it have to be in place before Scotland, if it was independent, became a candidate country? No, I don't think it has to be in place before that, but I, I think it can be in place okay. before that. And I think if you if you look at the likely timing, so there's, there's maybe other aspects to this that would be good to touch on. If on day one, the Scottish government has decided, day one of independence, to put its application in on day one, that it's a... Um, got that ready during during the separation talks with the rest of the UK. In my analysis, that could take up to a year because, first of all, the Commission will prepare an opinion on Scotland's readiness to be a candidate country. Um, then it will put a proposal forward to the European Council, which is, the, as you know, the EU's leaders. And then you have to see if the EU leaders agree, um, which I think they would do, um, <laughs> If we're thinking some point in the next 10 years, obviously it's not going to be that long since we left the European Union. Um, and then eventually uh, Scotland is recognised as a candidate. There are then uh, discussions. Then, then you have to get one step beyond that to agree to open accession negotiations. You get a negotiating framework. You start talking about some of the pre-accession funding that may be available, as well as all the sort of harder work on making sure you've got all the laws and all the institutions you need. You know, it's a, it's a very hard work process, the negotiation. It's not in many ways a negotiation. It's more like an ongoing test. You know, have you done this? Are you ready for this? Are you good enough on that? So not great fun at one level, except you know what you're, you're doing. Mm. So in parallel to that, basically, uh, there will be discussions on an association agreement. And I think there's a very open question for me as to how long that might take to negotiate, even though, as I say, there are sort of outline templates in the fact that there are others existing for all the current candidates, um, Scotland would still need its own. So maybe it could be done in three or six months, or maybe it would take 12 months. Um, mm -hmm. So then, th then there's potentially a gap and there's a pre-association agreement question about what you do in that gap when you've left the UK, but you don't yet have your association agreement. Normally, and we saw this, if you remember, with Brexit, the EU 
agreed a withdrawal agreement from the EU with the UK government but it, before it left the EU, but it wouldn't agree the trade and cooperation agreement we now have until it became a third country. Mm -hmm. And you would expect it to do the same with Scotland, but there's a big but and a but that I think is maybe in Scotland's interests, which is if Scotland's leaving the UK, then the UK in that EU-UK trade agreement, trade and cooperation agreement that regulates relations today, trade and other relations, would no longer apply to the right geographical mass and it wouldn't apply to the right sea and ocean, fishing waters and so on either. So I think there will be two options. Either you, you, um, the EU will have to actually talk to Scotland before it becomes a state, or the simple way around that, as in Brexit, would be to have a transition period where you extend the EU-UK trade and cooperation agreement until you've negotiated the association mm -hmm. agreement. That would need the UK's agreement too, but mm -hmm. something's going to have to be done and, and the UK is going to have to do something. It cannot opt to do nothing. If Scotland's not independent by the mid-2030s, do we risk being left behind? I think it's an interesting question because what we're seeing at the moment in the EU, and it's very encouraging and there's so many difficult challenges out there. It's, it's a good thing to see. We're seeing much more renewed enlargement momentum. This is very much driven by Russia's war on Ukraine. And it's it's really uh, pushed the EU to recognize its core values that it was established out of the Second World War. It was established as a peace project. And so at the December summit, the EU leaders agreed to open talks probably in March, with Ukraine and Moldova. They made Georgia a candidate country. The Western Balkan countries who've been candidates for a long, long time and not getting anywhere for a, for a whole mixture of reasons, they're trying to speed that process up. And, and you can see it taking off in some of the discussions across the EU in think tanks, in media, where people are saying, well, how much does the EU have to change to be able to cope with up to nine new members? Do we have to have majority voting on foreign policy or on budget issues? How can we make sure, as we see with Hungary being difficult at the moment, that no one country uh, just vetoes everything? So I don't think Scotland exactly risks being left behind. But it's, you know, if the EU was to manage to maintain that political energy, if there isn't, a, you know, a too terrible outcome of the, the war in Ukraine, you know, if, if there's this big bang enlargement by 2035 and Scotland's not there, it's going to feel perhaps even more on the margins. Mm -hmm. I did see somebody on, on X, we're now meant to call it, uh, a few weeks ago, I think an academic, and he, and I think it was a he, was saying, this is going to be the EU's last enlargement. And I replied and said, but what if an independent Scotland wants to join or Norway wants to join and not be in the European economic area anymore? And, and they replied and they said, oh, yes, well, that would just be an extra bit of sweeping up almost. So, you know, there's not going to not be any more enlargement, but it's a very dynamic moment. Mm -hmm. um, and it would be great to see Scotland part of that. So what benefits could Scotland, uh, once it's independent, get from an association agreement? It, for example, would there be access to the single market or funding for, for projects and stuff like that? It, it will depend on, on, obviously, on the details of the particular association agreement. But I think the, the way to think of an association agreement is, is its very first step. It's a free trade agreement. So that's at heart, what the current UK-EU trade deal is, it's not, as you, as you know, it's not, it's not a strong or a good deal because the, the Tory government wouldn't choose to be in the single market, but it takes away tariff barriers, um, but it keeps a lot of regulatory barriers in the way. So it, in its first instance, it would be a free trade agreement, which would be great as a first step, but it might and very likely would include a whole range of types of cooperation on it could be on educational issues some sort of political issues climate climate mm -hmm. issues and it would also um look at the extent to which scotland was aligned with eu regulations from health and phytosanitary plant and food and animal health to to manufacturing regulations and the closer those 
the more those rules were aligned, then the more the regulatory barriers would start to come okay. down. And what we also see there was the problem with the UK trade agreement um, is that there's no agreement around key customs procedures, and obviously we're not in the customs union anymore, and so something technical called rules of origin create a problem. So you can't just import something from China to Britain and then import it on tariff-free to the EU. Mm -hmm. So the association agreement could also help with Scotland and the EU not having too many blocks from the rules of origin problem that the UK currently has. Now, not all these things would necessarily happen at once. Um, some of them might be phased in over time, especially where Scotland won't be aligned with all the rules and all the regulations. So what should Scotland offer in return? Well, it, it, it's a two-way two deal. So obviously free trade goes in both directions, lack, lack of customs checks or some agreement on this thing called rules of origin or agreements uh, around climate are two-way, just like the negotiations to join the EU. This is not an even negotiation. The EU is much bigger. It has a lot of power. It's its rules and laws that Scotland would be trying to align with. But obviously, Scotland, yeah, Scotland is is a market for EU imports. It will offer um, a good base for EU companies if they want to invest uh, in Scotland, and also for non-EU companies if they can invest in Scotland and also benefit from this association agreement. Then there's an, an open question, which I can't answer, but there's a question around free movement issues, or if you're not jumping straight to free movement, but what would you do as an independent country? What sort of migration deal would you have with the EU? And could that be put into the association agreement um, and so could you start to gain some benefits from that compared to today again before you actually became an EU member state? It seems that like having an association agreement is a kind of first step to, towards rejoining the EU. A lot of people are talking about EFTA, EEA and they're saying oh no that that's a, that should be a first step. What do you think about that? I, I've always said that's misleading if you want to be a candidate to join the EU, and if you apply, as we were saying, or as I was saying, you know, if you apply as you could on day one of independence, then you follow the path that the EU says its candidates should follow. And the EU expects its candidates to have a trade agreement with it called an association agreement, because it's, as we've discussed, it's a, it's a much broader thing than just, just trade. So, the European economic area is an alternative to being in the EU. It's not uh, a transition path. You know, we were talking about transition. Mm -hmm. And I think the other thing to be very clear about, because some people aren't, is that if you join EFTA, the European Free Trade Area, in order to join the European Economic Area, <laughs> as that's the only route if you're not an EU member state, you cannot also join the EU's customs union. Because if you're in EFTA, you have to try and join the bilateral trade agreements that EFTA already has with a number of countries. So that's a condition of joining. Um, and so what I was talking about earlier, al although it sounds complex, things like these rules of origin, in other words, this thing to stop China bringing exports into the UK and then getting around the tariffs it faces into the EU by routing them through the UK, which you get round if you have a customs union, you can't do that if you're in the EEA. Obviously, you're also you're not at the table. You don't have therefore you're not in all the meetings, so you have a tiny voice, but you don't have a the voice you'd have as a member state. You don't have a vote. And what we see since the EEA was founded in 1995, apart from the four founding members, then no other state has tried to join it. They've all wanted, despite the barriers, to join the EU. So if you look at the Western Balkans, you know, these are countries that, that obviously were mired in war and conflict in the 1990s and have faced a lot of economic and political problems all the way through to today. But not one of them has said, oh, we're going to go and join Norway in the EEA. So, you, you know, you really have to ask, what, why not? 
And we also know that back then, Norway wanted to join the EU, but a, a referendum of its public said they didn't want to. So if a majority of the Scottish wanted to join the EEA and didn't want to join the EU, that would be obviously a completely different political and democratic situation. But today it's clear we have quite a, a big majority in Scotland for joining the EU. And so it, it doesn't figure politically for the moment and it's not a transition route to the EU. Okay, that's that's very interesting. Thank you very much, Kirsty. That's that's brilliant. Now we're going to have the first of our discussion topics here. So if you'd like to take part, just pause the podcast and consider this question. Having heard from Heather Anderson and Kirsty Hughes, do you think we should be looking at joining EFTA or the EU? And when you're ready to rejoin the podcast, just press play. The next theme the workshop looked at was the question of borders. Once we're um, independent and um, joining the EU and that process, um, we'll have to look at the border between Scotland and the EU. Um, and there'll be no checks on goods either way in that situation. The border between Scotland and England, as far as trade and goods is concerned, there are two main crossing points for HGVs, for trucks. So that's the A74 M6 and the um, A1 to the east. Uh, so and there will have to be checks, but we're going to look at you know how that can be dealt with. Between Scotland and Northern Ireland, well, assuming that uh, you know the Northern Ireland protocol is still in place, then we don't have to worry about uh, about good, because it will be similar to the border between Scotland and the EU. So I, I need to tell you a wee bit about Scottish government policy. This, so this is from the um, this is from the Scottish government paper. Um, so according to that paper, the Scottish government would expect to use a single trade window, in other words, a one-stop shop online platform where traders submit their documents in advance, uh, and that means fewer and faster checks at the actual border. Okay, so reducing the need for massive infrastructure. Many enforcement measures will take place not at the border itself, but at other places, maybe within the border or just the other side, um, at shops or other uh, situations. Uh, so there would be food sampling, there would be checks on alcohol, um, all that sort of thing. And then there would be spot checks as well, um, to, so that, that would ensure the integrity of the European single market. Um, and uh, protect consumers, can, uh, protect animal health, ensure that animal health is okay and in line uh, with EU standards and so on, and food safety, and also uh, fair taxation in relation to alcohol in particular. There could be also be a UK uh, EU veterinary agreement, and that would help as well, so there are moves in that direction, um, favoured by Labour. So, and where you've got minor routes, okay, there's a lot of um, there's a lot of minor roads between Scotland and England. Um, I think somebody here counted them at one point. There were almost exactly half the number between Northern Ireland and the Republic of Ireland. Oh, right. Okay. Right. Thank you for that. Um, <laughs> it's still a lot, but you can have, um, well, the Scottish Government plan is that there would be, um, uh, you know, like number plate recognition, that kind of solution for the minor roads. So, the, you know, a lot of planning is going into it and we can discuss that in a moment. Next, the workshop was shown a film about the common travel area. Now, I can't show you the film on an audio podcast, obviously, and there was no audio to it. It was just visual. But what it actually said was the common travel area allows Irish and British citizens to live, work and study in each other's countries. The common travel area predates our EU membership. After Brexit, Ireland, the UK and the EU all agree that the common travel area will continue. Under the common travel area... Irish and British citizens can move freely, live and enjoy the right to work in either country. Citizens can also access all levels of education, publicly funded health services, social security rights, social housing and vote in local and national parliamentary elections. Ireland and the UK will continue to work together on the common travel area into the future. And that was a film from the Irish government preparing for Brexit. And the implication, obviously, is Scotland is also part of the common travel area and would be after independence as well. And this is just a taster of one of the table discussions. It's just a couple of minutes. And 
what Heather said actually, that um, because the landmass had changed um, from the landmass that they actually made the agreement, then surely that means that, that the rest of the UK would have to renegotiate their agreement with the EU as well. So that actually might mean that it would give the people that in the, in the rest of the UK who want to rejoin the EU, it would give them a kind of a, a point in time to try and rejoin, rejoin the EU as well. So it might actually... So I've always kind of fought against... A lot of people in the group have been trying quite keen for um, the s eu to sort of reach out to four EU groups um, down south. And I've been a bit like, oh, that's a waste of time, why are we wasting our time? But actually, if we could put it to them that if Scotland did join, then that actually would mean that the rest of the UK would have. I've had Christy in a different situation say that she could... Um, envisage that it would be a three-way negotiation. I mean, everyone at the table at the same time. Yeah. So us, the EU, and you know, the rest of the UK. Yeah. The rest of the UK. Yeah. From that sort of, yeah. from that sort of reasoning, I hadn't thought about it from the point of view of actually that might give the folk the yes support down and down. So I know. But even the UK government, whatever it is, to, it to it, at least to rejoin, consider rejoining the, 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 Europe, the single market will be the EEA. Yeah. Right? The customs union. The customs union. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it, would, it potentially would give them that a sort of yeah. opportunity yeah. to get their voice heard. And... Now, if you want to pause the podcast and have some discussion, question two is how do we make the land border with England as frictionless as possible? And when you're ready, rejoin the podcast. With the next theme is currency. According to an independent Scotland in the EU, the Scottish Government would apply to join the EU as soon as possible after independence, while continuing to use sterling at the point of application. The process of establishing a Scottish pound would be closely aligned with the process of rejoining the EU. In relation to the EU, as the European Commission has made clear, no timetable for member states joining the Eurozone is prescribed and as for other new EU member states, joining the Euro would happen only if the, both the conditions for doing so, known as the convergence criteria, were met and the Parliament of an independent Scotland decided that this was the right course of action to take. So that's the first myth. We don't need to join the Euro. The architecture of the Economic and Monetary Union, the EMU, explicitly stipulates that a country will only join the Euro when it is ready and the convergence criteria are there to ensure that in introducing the single currency would be desirable to both the Member State and the Eurozone as a whole. According to a stronger economy with independence, among successful independent countries there is no single approach to the currency regime. The choice of currency is a product of economic and financial history and a political decision making. For example, Austria, Belgium, Ireland, Finland and the Netherlands share a currency, the euro, while Denmark, Iceland, Norway, Sweden and Switzerland have their own currencies. However, Denmark pegs its currency to the euro, meaning that it, it is shared a fixed exchange rate with the euro and shares it with Greenland and the Faroe Islands. The decision to peg the euro is a policy choice. Denmark's main trading market is the European Union, so pegging provides price stability for trade uh, with the 18 euro economies. We propose two phases for currency policy after independence. In phase one, from Independence Day, Scotland would continue to use the pound sterling. This does not require any formal agreement with the Westminster government. Sterling has been the legal currency in Scotland for centuries and is internationally traded. The continued use of sterling would allow time for new institutions, including an independent Scottish central bank, to be established during transition and to build credibility, ensuring continuity for citizens and businesses during the phase immediately after independence. In phase two, a new independent Scottish pound would be established. This would take place as soon as practical through a careful and managed transition. The decision about when the economic conditions are right would ultimately be for the Scottish Parliament. 
part of the remit of the post-independent Scottish Central Bank, which included advising on these economic conditions. Next, we had a video from Scottonomics. It's an interview with Marla Dukaran, who is an economist from the Caribbean. And she was asked whether currency unions work. In this life, <laughs> everything is a trade-off, right? <laughs> there will be advantages and disadvantages to having your own currency. I think that the main advantage to having your own currency is that it gives you a policy tool that you can use to manage your economy. And it's a very important policy tool if you are a country that is quite open. For us in the Caribbean, most of us, total exports plus imports over GDP is over 100%, right? The amount of trade that we engage in to survive explains most of our economy, right? We, we sell tourism, we sell oil and gas, we still sell sugar and rum. In order to um, import the food and fuel that we need to survive. So, if you're a highly open economy, and I know that Scotland does have oil and gas as well, if you're a highly open economy, you export a lot and you import a lot, then your currency becomes that much more powerful a tool to manage your economy than if you were not an open economy. The other consideration is when you use somebody else's currency, you almost import their, their inflation and their interest rate policy. So, for example, you have the U.S. during the pandemic, they engage in unprecedented monetary easing and fiscal easing and stimulus. And then post-pandemic, so in 2021 into 2022 early, they tighten monetary policy. Now, if my country was using the US dollar, that means interest rates on my currency would go up. And if I had to borrow, it would be that much more expensive. But my country is in a recession. Why would I want higher interest rates? I wouldn't. But the US was not in a recession when they started hiking interest rates. So you import their policy when it may not be relevant to your own economic scenario at that point in time. So there's a real danger with using somebody else's currency for that reason as well. There can be benefits to being in a monetary union. Stability is one of them. Certainly in the Eastern Caribbean, the currency union is credited as, as being responsible for a lot of their financial and monetary stability um, and price movements as well in terms of their inflation. But that's because these countries are very similar in nature, right? And so it makes sense for them to have a monetary union. But when you have a monetary union like the EU, where you have a country like Jib that has the same currency, same interest rate policy at the same time as a country like Greece or now Latvia, I mean, when I look at that, and, I, and for a small country, I just think, that's just so wrong. It just makes no sense. So unless you are very, very similar, and your trade is so integrated, and other things are so integrated that it makes sense to have a monetary union, perhaps it's best to have your own. And again, a little flavour of the table discussion. Part of our challenge in 2014 was saying to people, don't worry about it, the UK will still continue to pay your pension. But actually, it's a nonsense. I mean, we don't, pension, there isn't a pot of money that pays people's pensions. It's, what, it's the money that the country gets in this year that pays the pension. That's what Scotland will continue to do. Um, do you think there's any other scenario that... Well, yes, as I was saying, there's the other scenario where um, you, from the, you treat pension entitlement earned up to the point of independence as still being payable by the UK government. That has been debated as a possible scenario, as I say, in the same way as currently applies to UK pensioners who move to any other country. They yeah. can still draw their UK pension. So, in terms of key constraints to full alignment, and in terms of the Scottish currency, not having an independent Scottish bank, we do have a, an investment bank, don't we? So we need a central bank, don't we? That's we different do. from the investment a, bank. We need a central bank. Yeah. So that, can we still be using the, the English pound? 
while joining the EU. And that, that's a big point of debate. And most people think it would, it would require a concession from the EU, but, but most people think the EU would give that concession as long as it was for a limited period. It might depend on how long it took us to get to the point of actually joining the EU, though, wouldn't yes, it? I mean, yes, it's sure. quite likely that we could have set up our own currency before that. I think when they're talking about as soon as possible, they mean absolutely as soon as, as, as possible. possible. And discussion question three is, what do we need to do to get ready to issue a Scottish currency? When you're ready, rejoin us and we'll, we'll be moving on to talk about farm payment scheme. And here's Heather Anderson to explain what that means. Basically, the Scottish Government have maintained the budget of £650 million for agriculture. We used to get £650 million into Scotland from the European Union for farming. That money was distributed in two uh, columns. Pillar 1, which is the direct payment, and Pillar 2, which was the environmental schemes. Now, Pillar 1, 85% of the 650 million goes into Pillar 1 at the moment. Um, that is a direct payment for owning land, and the more land you have, and the better land you've got, the more money you get. Right? Now, the disaster for Scotland is most of you will know, we've got the most feudal land tenure in the Northern Hemisphere. So what this actually does is mean that the top 10% wealthiest, biggest farmers and landowners in Scotland get 40% of that budget. Now that meant that last year, um, there were four, there were sing they're called single farm payments, and last year there were four of them that were above a million pounds. There's nowhere in the Northern Hemisphere, like Napoleon didn't make it to Scotland, <laughs> so we've got these enormous areas of land owned by one person, 385 people in half of Scotland, and they, get, and they do not have to put a spade in the ground to get this money. There is no exchange. It's an entitlement, right? So 85% of the money goes to and you get that for owning land that you probably didn't pay for um, from a long time ago. Um, and you get the more, the better land you've got. Fifteen percent is pillar two, and they, that's what to be applied for, and that's for environmental schemes. So that's the current setup. Now, when Brexit came along, I think we have been arguing about this system for about ten years, and because of Brexit, we just defend this system, right? Um, but basically, what Europe has done is um, it has focused on capping payments and it's focused on redistribution. They don't have the same problem with land. Nobody in, in Europe owns the scale of land that people in Scotland have. So they've still got the two pillars, but they've put less and less money into pillar one and more and more money into the environment and they've capped the payments. We got agreement at SNP conference from a motion um, that's not been implemented as government policy to cap the payments at 66,000 euros, 66,000 pounds. So we're saying it's not that you won't get anything for owning land, but you can't get more than 60 odd thousand pounds a year, every year, for doing nothing. If the Scottish Government cap those payments, which is what Europe, that's what Ireland's done, is basically saying you can't get more than this sum of money and more money has to go into the environment. If we cap them, it would create 200, you know, 20 odd million pounds worth of savings here. Why haven't we done it then? That's a political question. Um, and there's a lot of lobbying by land of the states, National Farmers Union, to not change this. So where we are now, exactly, is we've got an agricultural bill at stage one. What the Scottish Government is proposing as a structure is four tiers, Right? Tier 1 and 2 are going to be your basic payment. And the Scottish Government have committed to the fact that 50% of your basic payment um, must be conditional on you doing something. <laughs> right? Which is progress. <laughs> right? And, and so Tier 1 is about owning land, but they've put in some conditions about saying if you're going to get this money, you have to have a whole farm payment, and the farmers are going, that's absolutely shocking and abysmal. Right? You know, having a plan for your farm isn't that unreasonable. <laughs> um, and then there's other conditions about not degrading peatland and all this kind of stuff. So there's, there's the big, big fight at the moment is how many conditions are there going to be? when you get the payment in the first place, and what is the 
distribution, right? So the Scottish Government said they wanted it to be 50-50, um, the farming organisations wanted it to be 85-25, and the environment organisations wanted it to be 20-75. They wanted money to go. So that's what, that's what the fights are about at the moment, okay? Um, tier 2 is about environmental improvement, so it's basically saying you'll get something as a direct payment and then you can apply to get an extra bit, but you have to be doing something for the environment. So believe it or not, that's progress. Tier 3 is, an enhanced, is for enhanced measures, so tier 2 you might get your money because you say I'm an organic farmer, so I'm not using artificial nitrogen, so I'm not emitting as much greenhouse gases. But tier three would be where you go to get the money to convert to organic farming, not just be one. Or it might be that you say, right, I'm doing a lot of agroecology, I'm planting trees, putting in woodland, and tier three would be where you would go to plant the trees, right? So does that make sense? So this is, this is enhanced things to help you make the transition, the just transition, to do the environmental bit. And tier four is cross-sector support around innovation and advice. So this is a structure that is being proposed. This is um, this has been out for consultation, and in the next month or so, the Scottish Government will announce um, what the numbers are here, whether it's 50-50, what the conditions are. Um, the worry is my usually is going to announce it at the National Farmers Union in Scotland conference, so um, that would suggest that we've done a lot of lobbying. So anyhow, that's where we are. Where Europe has gone is it's had a farm to fork policy. So for the last sort of 10 years, it's been very much saying we want to support small farms, family farm farms, local food production. We don't want big agri businesses. We're going to put our subsidy into smaller farming. Um, we're going to shorten the food supply chain. We're going to increase the environmental standards. Um, the things that are staggering, you need to know this, um, is back in... 2002, 8% of Scotland was organic. It's now under 2%. Right? In Europe, the target is that 25% of farming land in Europe is organic by 2025. By 2030, sorry. And Germany's brought out a plan to say 30% of farming in Germany will be organic by 2030. Now, what you will have probably heard is there's right, there's tractors lining up in France and big demonstrations. So what has happened, there was a the farm to fork policy and there was a sustainable agricultural law that was being proposed and the Commission have had to roll back on it because there's huge imports of grain from Ukraine coming into the European Union and the farmers are saying, well, we're not going to be environmental if you're going to import all this stuff. So it's a very live political situation the direction in Europe is very much towards you've got to use the land to challenge climate change and be sustainable and we need to have more short supply chains. So that is what we would be having to do to align with that. And that's what Scottish Government policy says. It's, it's just not necessarily that we might end up unless we're bold here. We'll still support farming but there have to be some conditions and the conditions have to tie up with climate change, um, you know, biodiversity, environmental standards. We can't just keep farming the way we are and not link these you know, two agendas. So discussion question four is, what would you like to see included in the agriculture bill? Then the next topic is interconnectors. So I just want to introduce the topic of Scottish renewable energy uh, not being integrated into the EU-wide grid. All EU member states are committed to turning the EU into the first climate-neutral continent by 2050. To get there, they pledge to reduce emissions by at least 55% by 2030, compared with 1990 levels. This means increasing access to electricity from renewable sources across Europe by increasing the number of interconnectors between countries on land and under the sea. And you can see there where they all go. All down to England at the moment. The onshore transmission network in Scotland is privately owned. Scotland's surplus energy is sent to England by the privatised national grid. Two new electricity superhighways are being built by the national grid 
East Lothian to Durham, Peterhead to Drax in North Yorkshire. It's going straight down to England, and then anything that's surplus is then sent to France, Belgium, Netherlands and Denmark via England's undersea cables and interconnectors. The total amount of energy exported from Scotland in 2022 was worth £4 billion. England currently has eight undersea interconnectors with neighbouring EU countries, including the latest Viking Link, which stretches 475 miles from Lincolnshire to southern Jutland in Denmark and took five years to construct. Scotland has only one short interconnector, which links Western Scotland with Northern Ireland. Ten EU countries are planning to build an offshore grid in the North Sea. People are thinking about energy more than ever. The rise in energy prices has really focused minds in governments and on the streets. Everyone is clear. High gas prices are the problem. That's what's pushed up electricity prices. Europe is consuming and importing too many fossil fuels. We need more renewables and we need them quickly. The climate crisis only reinforces this urgency. Renewables are now around 40% of the electricity we consume in Europe. That's not bad, but electricity is still only one quarter of all the energy we consume. The rest is the petrol we put in our cars, the gas boilers in our homes, the fossil fuels that still power much of our industry and our ships and aeroplanes. If we want to decarbonize our economies and be less dependent on imported oil and gas, we have to increase the share of electricity in our energy mix. Electric cars, electric heat pumps in our homes and offices, electric boilers in our heating systems, manufacturing powered by electricity. The European Union totally gets this. They want electricity to be three quarters of our energy mix by 2050. They want our transport buildings and industry to run 57% on electricity, with another 18% running on hydrogen produced from electricity. Now, where's all this electricity going to come from? The EU want one half of it to come from wind. This gives us huge opportunities and a huge responsibility. The EU want a huge increase in offshore wind. They want an even bigger increase in onshore wind. This is affordable. We have the technology. The finance is available. The challenge is the permitting. We need simpler rules and procedures and more staff in the permitting authorities. We also need to invest more in grids. And we need to take care of our supply chain and invest in our workforce and skills. Then we need to help energy consumers who want to go electric. The industries who want to decarbonize and are knocking on our door to sign PPAs. Those building the infrastructure to electrify transport and heating. The hydrogen providers who want to run their electrolyzers on wind. These people want wind. Governments want more wind. Communities want wind. Let's make it happen. Let's help Europe go electric. Interconnectors are high voltage cables that connect our electricity system with the electricity systems of neighboring countries. They allow us to share renewable energy, such as wind or solar power, with other countries. When the wind is blowing or the sun is shining in the UK, we can share excess energy with our neighbors. When we need more energy, we can import it from them. We already have interconnectors connecting the UK to France, Belgium, Norway and the Netherlands. And we have another interconnector to Denmark in the works. How will interconnectors help us reach net zero? By sharing energy between countries, interconnectors give all of our energy systems access to more clean, renewable energy. This will help each country to reduce the amount of electricity they produce from more carbon intensive power stations. It also means that we all have access to a broader and more flexible supply of electricity as and when we need it. By 2030, 90% of the energy we import through interconnectors will be from zero carbon energy sources, helping us get closer to net zero.
It's estimated that interconnectors will help us avoid around 100 million tons of carbon emissions from power generation between 2020 and 2030. The future of interconnectors. At the moment, offshore wind farms and interconnectors operate separately, each connecting to the shore individually. But we're developing multi-purpose interconnectors. They work by connecting clusters of offshore wind farms to multiple countries via interconnectors. This makes sharing clean energy between countries even easier, as well as reducing the impact of infrastructure on coastal communities. These exciting new technologies will help us all to achieve a cleaner energy future together. Scotland doesn't have any interconnectors with EU countries, and they take at least 10 years to build. So the last discussion question, how can we get ready to integrate with the EU's energy policy? And Morag asks for key messages from the workshop. There's a lot to think about. Yeah. There sure is, and thank you for thinking about it and writing your responses. I suppose that the first thing I would say, I've learned such a lot from this afternoon. Lots of things I didn't know about, and, and I'm really, really pleased, particularly about, about farming and energy. But I suppose that what I'm left with from today isn't necessarily really positive. What I'm left with is it feels to me that the UK is deliberately not building the infrastructure that Scotland needs because they know the inevitability of independence and if it's 10 years to build a, a, an, a, an interconnector then it's 10 years they can absolutely uh, they feel that they will have that energy while they negotiate other energy situations while we still are dependent on them for the funds that we would ex extract from it. The same with ferry ports. I was involved in local government in England at the point where there was massive amounts of local government reorganisation. And the, the big counties that lost their unitary part five, six years before just let that part run down. They didn't invest in it, they didn't maintain, they didn't decorate, they didn't do anything. And the unitaries had to start again um, from scratch at the point they became a unitary authority. I feel as if that's what's happening to yeah. Scotland. Mm -hmm. We're being run down and underinvested in by a, by a union that knows it's lost the argument that it's, a po that it's a positive argument for the union. So they're just stripping us. Yeah. They're asset yeah. stripping us. And I don't know why I've just came to the realisation now, but it's really upsetting. Yeah. Anyway, that sadly was my takeaway. Yeah, thanks for that, Jackie. <laughs> <laughs> it's a bit sad, but you're, you're absolutely right. A, a small sort of reflection. So I didn't know that Georgia, you know, on the other side of the Black Sea, had an association agreement with the European Union. Yeah. And, and I was going, oh, come on, Scotland. I mean, if Georgia, that's a brave move. They've got a land border with Russia. Mm -hmm. And we know what Russia thinks about yeah. joining the EU. So I, I just felt, well, for goodness sake, if Georgia can do it, we need to get our mojo going and, and, and just be confident in, in uh, what we could do. And it was great, Heather, hearing what you fed in to us about the comments that you get over in, in the European Union mm -hmm. about Scotland being a great wee country. So. <laughs> Cheers, Molly. Um, in fact, um, knowing what um, other people uh, think about Scotland is really uh, interesting. And we often hear that. Um, people when we're out on the, on the street. Mm -hmm. We talk to tourists in Edinburgh, for example, and they love Scotland and they're, they're very keen to see us back in the UK. All I can say is that my enthusiasm for independence as a European nation has not diminished. It gets stronger and stronger. So part of, like, we've been asset stripped for quite some time, like we did have oil in the North Sea that funded the deindustrialisation of Scotland. So if we can keep explaining to people, and you know, I don't think that they're deliberately not building the interconnectors to Europe from Scotland to spite us in the future. They don't even, we're just supplying them, we're a supplier group for them, you know? So we've just been this colony that's been stripped of assets for a very, very long time. So regaining that confidence about saying we're not doing it anymore, we could do a better job ourselves is absolutely vitally important. We just need to get that fucking independence thing is what I do. Okay. <laughs> I've been listening to a fantastic book, which is it's not the what, it's the why. So I think we've all gathered a lot of information today that kind of take us to the what, but more than that, 
at the doors, and as more I said, when we are out and about and we talk to people, is the why, is transmitting the passion. Food is emotional. So get your emotions up, <laughs> fight the why, fight your drive. I think we have a lot here, and let's get out to this. <laughs>